Hello, and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench, we have a small collection of soldering irons. I was having a discussion with one of the patrons to the channel, and they'd asked a question that was far more nuanced than even I thought when um, the question was posed, which we will get into here in a little bit. Given the title of the video and the opening, you can imagine it revolves around soldering. But the question was far more nuanced than even I imagined when I was typing up a response. And I figured it would be good to get some information out there and do a video on it. So that is this video. So I did a video previous to this where we talked a lot about solder and the different types of solder. This is going to focus mainly on the irons. Obviously, the act of soldering requires both. And both are actually important, and far more important than even I thought at first glance. So, taking a look at the anatomy of a soldering iron, uh, this is a pencil-style iron. They make um, gun-style units as well that can have higher wattages and things like that. And I do have a couple of the solder guns, but they don't see a lot of use on the bench. So this one I'm going to stick to the stuff that gets used the most. And you guys will be able to tell how it's used the most by looking at the front of the tip here and just seeing how oxidized the tips are. The thing with these Heiko irons, I like them. Um, I have never had to replace a tip that's been worn out yet. So all the soldering that I've done on YouTube, things like that, has all been done with the same iron. Not all the same tips. I have a variety of tips that I use, but I've never had to replace one because it's worn out. These tips are incredibly high quality. And I've been really happy with it. Heiko was the one that I chose to go with for the lab. This is not a Heiko sponsored video or anything like that. It's just what uh, fit the bill at the time. And I think I'm going to try the Gen 2 stuff. Uh, I think they're phasing out the FM203s at the moment. And there's another generation that's going to be coming in. I'm going to probably try some of those because there's some features that I wanted that I didn't get in the 203 series that I'm really hoping they did a, they did better on in the next version. But the other thing that the next version is going to give me is a double double power rating. This particular pencil is good for 70, uh, 70 watts. The newer pencils go up to 140. So especially when I have to solder very large components, um, that extra power is going to come in and, and will be quite nice. But that gets us into just the anatomy of a soldering pencil. There's a body, some form of hand grip, and then the tip itself. A couple of things to think about when picking an iron is this tip to grip ratio. Um, there's a couple of irons, Metcal being one of them, where this is really short. Like the tip is about here coming out of the pencil. And it can actually make using the devices uh, or using the irons a lot easier. It gives you a lot better tip control. If the tip was way out here, uh, it would be a lot harder to control the tip from back here. So having a shorter tip to where your hand grip is is actually beneficial for, for tip control, especially in the finer irons. We'll get out the micro pencil here real quick. That's the micro pencil, so much smaller, but even a little shorter still. So when you're working on the very, very small components, um, it can get into places where the bigger iron can't. Probably more importantly than the ergonomics of the soldering iron is what the heating element is in the soldering iron and how well it does for tip control or uh, thermal transfer. The whole act of solder is to get the heat from the iron into the joint as fast as possible. So you can get in, get at, uh, wet the joint, get enough solder on it, and then get out as fast as possible without overheating the component or the pad or the board or anything like that. So the tip thermal mass is really important. And that's where in this particular style of iron, different tips come in. So I have, for some of my heavier duty soldering irons, soldering jobs, we have a tip with a much larger thermal mass. So the business end is where it's silver. This is tarnish, 
So you can tell I use this tip a little bit, nowhere near as much as this, because you can tell from the tarnish right here that uh, this tip has seen a lot of hours in the iron, and it is. This is probably the most used tip in the lab for getting things done. And I even have this exact, uh, this same size tip in the N2 iron and things like that, but the N2 is outside the scope of this video, so we'll talk about that later. But when I need to do a heavier soldering job, even though these are both 70 watt tips, this tip has a lot more thermal mass and it can dump that thermal mass much faster into a larger joint. So, so tip size can be quite important for sizing the tip to what you're working on. This is not a case where the changing of the tip changes the temperature. The temperature is still set the same. It's just how much heat is stored in the tip for the heating element to have to turn on and off and cycle to um, dump heat into the joint. So this is actually the smallest chisel tip that I can find. This is not a conical tip. This is a chisel tip, and I do find that I prefer chisel tips for thermal transfer because the flat spot really helps. We have a slightly larger chisel tip, even bigger still. And then this is not a conical tip either. This is a chisel tip, but it has a monster thermal mass. So this tip sees quite a bit of use. And then for the bigger components, especially some of the larger power caps, things like that, uh, this tip can come into play. This tip gets used a lot with uh, ceramic strips that can take a ton of heat off of the um, off of the iron and where you need the iron to power through to get the solder to melt and behave. This tip I usually use for chassis work. So if I'm if I have to get a ground attached to a chassis or something like that, um, I find this tip actually does a pretty good job. Even though it's only 70 watts, it can still do um, it can dump enough thermal mass to get a chassis hot. Which gets me into the next Thing that I wanted to talk about on these tips is the type of heating element. Here's a tip that doesn't see much use in the lab. You can tell from the badging that these are the T15 tips and then the various sizes are after the T15 line. So with soldering irons, there's three main ways that the tip gets hot. The, the older way would be very similar to where the Hako 888D operates, and that is the tip is actually a sleeve that goes over a ceramic heating element. It's a good design, works just fine. Um, so if you have one, I'm not bashing on the uh, that design at all. The difference is where the temperature probe is stored. So for the iron, or at least the power supply for the iron, it's watching the temperature of that heating element and it's pulsing it to keep it at the set point. So if you have a sleeve-based unit, the temperature sensor is in the ceramic core that's the heater. And uh, there can be a little bit of a thermal lag to where you suck a whole lot of heat out of the tip and it takes the iron a second to wake up and go, oh, power, and then start applying power to put more to put more heat into the iron tip up here where it actually needs it. The thing with that is, depending on what you're soldering, that may or may not be a problem. Uh, you get some very high thermal mass um, parts, get some very high thermal mass PCBs, ceramic strip, for instance. It can soak a lot of heat out of the iron before it wakes up and starts applying power again. The drawback of these style tip is the heating element, the temperature sensor, and everything like that is embedded into the tip. So these tips tend to be a little bit more expensive than the sleeve style. They tend to react faster. So that's essentially what you're getting is you're getting a tighter feedback loop and you're getting, because the tip is bonded to the heating element, you get a faster thermal, you get a faster reaction time, faster recovery time, and a more rapid thermal transfer into the workpiece. Now, what does that transfer into? That ultimately transfers in the soldering iron to, you get to solder at a lower temperature. Uh, when you need more heat, sometimes you have to turn it, crank it up a little bit, sometimes you have to crank it down a little bit. So what I have found is this iron 
especially this iron with this tip, is not very fiddly when it comes to thermal set point. Um, I set a specific temperature, and I can solder at that temperature for most jobs. Now, I, I did call out when I had to adjust the irons. I had to adjust the uh, desolder tool and the soldering iron was when I was working on those HP 8904s. The thermal mass of the board, because they were high current pads, coupled with the very large legs on the power capacitors, coupled with the conformal coating that was on the board that I had to burn through, meant I had to tweak the iron up a little bit. Um, still well within the capabilities of the iron, not a problem, and it did and it did the job. The conformal coating clogged up the desolder tool quite a lot uh, more often, and I had to clean it more often to get through that job, but other than that, everything worked out okay. The third way a iron is heated is with RF, uh, and I believe that's how the Metcals work, and Hako has an RF iron. The thing that I don't like about the RF irons is the temperature is set by the tip that you plug in. So where my base stations have a temperature set point that I could, t uh, that I could tweak and change as I needed to, if I needed to goose the power on one of the Metcal units, I would, need to adjust, I would need to change tips to a hotter tip. Not really a fan of the design. It works. I know people that love them. I'm just personally not a fan of, of the design because I would need three different tips of, these, of this dimension. Where with the other way, I have a single tip and it's still running strong five years later. So let's talk about iron wattage. This is a 70 watt iron. You can find soldering irons as low as 15 watts, 30 watts, whatever. Really what that is, is the ability for the iron to dump heat into the work. So the higher the wattage, the faster that can happen. And uh, theoretically, the faster you can get in and do the joint. Soldering is more of an art form than it is a um, science. And it's really a feel skill. So I've, been solder I've had a soldering iron in my hand since I was nine. So I've been doing it for quite some time. So I really have a feel for how long a particular iron takes to heat a joint up, get the solder applied, get in there, get out, and uh, to work on the parts for to not overheat parts, burn things up. Copper, it turns out, is a fantastic conductor of heat, and we'll use a screwdriver as an analog. We'll say I have a diode here and I have a leg out here. A lot of parts have a tinned copper leg on them. Well, the problem is if I apply heat back here because co copper is so efficient at conducting heat, that heat will start to creep up the leg of the component. And if I stay too long down here, I'll put more and more and more, more heat until the body of the uh, diode starts heating up, until I get the diode past the point of where it should be, and it falls off. And I just killed the diode by overheating it. This was a much larger problem with older components than it is today, but I work on some stuff that has those older components in it, so I have to be aware of that. You really can do thermal damage to the parts with a too long of a dwell time on the joint. The faster I can dump the heat to the joint, the quicker I can get in, get it soldered, and get out before killing the, um, and not risk killing the component. One other thing you'll see on components is there'll be a expiration date on them. And if you buy a wheel of ICs or something like that in the, in the black epoxy packages, there'll be, a, um, there'll be a fresh date on them and there'll be a humidity sensor. This is not a fresh date of when the component goes bad. This is a fresh date for mass manufacturing of when the component would, will need to be dehydrated before it goes through a soldering process. If it's been open for too long and they put it through the reflow oven or the wave soldering machine, the, if the ICs have soaked up too much humidity out of the air, they can turn into popcorn and jump off the board. So that's obviously will generate some faults and is not good for manufacturing. So in a home shop, feel free to completely disregard all of that stuff. My wheels sit on a rack 
in a uh, temperature controlled room, but uh, I do, I'm not concerned about the humidity or anything like that, doing hand soldering and essentially small batch work. Uh, feel free to leave them open and it not be a big deal. I should also note the rack that I have is a rack designed for IC wheels and it is an anti-static rack that is actually strapped to ground to protect the components from static buildup. Humidity in the air will do that. We've talked about that in a few other videos. Um, with some air quality and static things, check out the back video catalog for some of that information. Okay, what your components are strapped to can also matter. Here is a chunk of aluminum, nice big aluminum extrusion, heat sink taken out of a UPS unit. And as we can see from the dust signature, here, 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 and here. I can actually tell this is a rectifier. This had a bunch of power silicon strapped to it. Having the power silicon strapped to a chunk of aluminum like this can actually make soldering it quite difficult because sometimes the uh, there's heat sinking from the chip to the silicon specifically, or I mean from the silicon to the aluminum specifically. And the legs can just suck a ton of heat into this heat sink before the, it'll finally get the joint hot enough to get the solder to wet. This is where the power of the iron comes in, where this iron with the uh, fast thermal response and the integrated heater can just start dumping more and more and more power into the joint until it finally goes. And you want that to happen as quickly as possible because the less heat we get into the component and we concentrate at the joint, the better it is for the component itself. It doesn't, we don't risk overheating the component. And depending on the set point of the iron, that can happen very rapidly. Speaking of joints that take a lot of heat to service, this is my Tech 310A. And take a look at this for servicing. Isn't that incredible? Um, these are the Tektronix ceramic strips and they can take an exorbitant amount of heat to get them to do their thing, especially with the solder that's aged on there. Typically, aged solder that's aged out should be mixed with fresh solder to get it to behave a little bit better during the desoldering and resoldering process. I've said this in a bunch of videos where I work on them, but these Tektronix ceramic strips, these need a silver-based solder. I uh, believe the roll is still on the back of this unit that they give you to work on these. I have a lead-free solder that I use that has a 3 or 4% silver content when I'm working on the ceramic strips. If you use the wrong solder too often, you can break the ceramic to silver bond, and these horseshoes will just pop out of the ceramic strip and uh, won't be effective anymore at holding the components. So definitely something to, be wa to watch out for in the very old uh, tech equipment. Now, with this being a... Um, Vacuum tube based scope, not just the CRT, but this is a full tube scope, no transistors. Anytime you have something like this open, elevated voltages are present. This has been off for a very long time, and I'm okay to uh, poke around in here, but um, definitely want to be careful of it, of poking fingers in here, because there are some pretty wicked supplies in one of these boxes. Lots of tuning adjustments in here. Um, I see a couple of things that I'd want to restore in uh, this particular unit, but the last time it was fired up, it showed a trace and showed signals with no problems. So it's a testament to um, the construction of some of this early tech stuff. This thing is factory. From what I can tell is this coil looks like it may have been tuned a little bit, but this is still factory sealed, and it's still working just fine like the day it was made. They definitely don't build it like this anymore. <laughs> For working on that ceramic strip units, I do need even a better, bigger tip for more thermal mass. So where this is my normal everyday tip, this is the tip that I'll use for working on the uh, ceramic strips with the higher thermal mass to get, to get the uh, joints to behave. So even this iron, as, as good as it is, struggles with some of that ceramic strip stuff. Uh, it just soaks so much heat out of the iron. 
One quick safety note on uh, PCB material that is made out of ceramic. One thing to check for is look uh, if you are working on with something that is ceramic, make sure it is not a beryllium oxide, especially if it's older. If it is a beryllium oxide, it's perfectly safe to work around. It is not safe to sand, grind, or make dust. Uh, this is also true if you're taking apart a microwave oven. There is a pink insulator in the magnetron that is normally beryllium oxide. There's a condition called beryllicosis that can happen if the dust gets in the lungs. So definitely want to take care, care with that. Um, if it is a beryllium oxide material, do not crush, grind, cut, or do anything that will make dust. And always wash hands. So how to set your iron tip, because I know how my irons behave, and I can give you a start point. My iron tips are at 650 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, I live in the part of the world where we are on the metric system, but we don't admit it. So we do everything in the weird imperial units of Fahrenheit as opposed to Celsius. What you're looking for in an iron, or, or setting the set point, is... You don't want the dwell time to be too long on the board. So what you want to do is use your iron, the, the boards you're working on, and you want to make see what can make it work fast. If it feels like you're working too slow or the iron's taking forever to transfer heat into the joint, make sure the iron's clean. Make sure you have a little bit of solder on the, on the iron. The best way for soldering that I have found is after the iron tip is clean, wet the iron a little bit. That's not to wet the joint, that's just for thermal transfer. Come into the joint and then bring the wire in from the other side. When it melts the solder, the joint's hot enough and, it'll, and then it'll kind of jump onto the joint and wet it and it'll make that nice dome shape that everybody's looking for. Having that just dab of solder on the iron, not a dead clean iron, but a little bit of solder on the iron can actually help with thermal transfer into the joint and the board. The other thing is you don't want to be completely on the board and you don't want to be completely on the component either. You want to kind of touch the component and the wire at the same time. We'll zoom in on this real quick. We'll say my, uh, the iron's off and everything, but we'll say my mat is a, um, my mat is the solder pad and this screwdriver is the component leg sticking up. So what you'll want to do, come on focus camera, is you want to come in to the joint, touch the pad with the tip, not the not the side of the iron. You don't want it laying flat like this. You want to come up on the tip and you want to hit the pad and the joint at the same time and then bring the solder wire in from the side that you don't have the iron on. Once the solder wire melts, get enough solder for the joint and then come away with both. Now, what you want is you want that heat transfer to be as fast as possible, as efficient as possible, and so you can work not only as quickly as possible, but you also don't overheat the component and get too much, too much thermal in the component itself. If you have a large FET or something like that, and you're just sitting there with the iron holding it, holding it, holding it, you can actually feel the chip heat up uh, when it starts dissipating heat out of the uh, component itself. That's getting too hot. One other note, iron quality is really important to the soldering experience. You do not need to be at a very high level to get a good quality soldering iron. However, in my opinion, doing this, again, this is only my opinion, but doing this professionally, the Hako 888D or like irons from other vendors would be the bare minimum that I would say is where you'd want to be for soldering iron uh, purchasing if I was going to go out and buy one. The quality of the iron cannot be overstressed. Uh, I have had the kits that come with irons that are, aren't even worth being called soldering irons. Like literally I was watching the tips erode as I was tinning them. Uh, so there is a huge difference between the $5 soldering iron and a soldering iron like the Hako 888D. So I would consider that the bare minimum of a decent soldering iron for regular work in soldering. 
if you're not going to do regular soldering and you just need it for once or twice, might work. But I, I didn't even get past the tinning phases with some of the soldering irons that I got in tool kits and a few other things. They really are not worth the trouble. Thanks for stopping by the lab today, taking a look at soldering irons a little bit more in depth. If you guys have anything to add, leave it in the comments below. Uh, every, we can all learn from each other. Check out the Patreon page. Patreons are five videos ahead at the moment. Uh, everything will come out to YouTube. There is nothing behind the paywall, but they're getting it about uh, five weeks early. The support of the Patreon page goes right back into the lab to help bring content to the channel, make videos for, make videos for YouTube, and bring you guys more content. If you would like, leave, me, leave the uh, message in the comment, comments below. If you'd like me to review some of the newer stuff from Heiko, I'm really happy with these irons right now, but I know uh, at the time they were available and they're being discontinued. So if I'm using something in the channel and I'd like it to be current to what you could buy, but we'll only do that if you guys think it's it would be of benefit because that's what this channel is. This channel's here for all of you. As always, I'll be in the comment section between videos. More is always on the way.